Nadia is a tireless advocate for those affected by neem and pick diseases, a rare and all too often overlooked group of genetic conditions which currently have no cure. Nadia's son, Zane, sadly passed away in 2017 at just four years of age, but his memory is a constant inspiration to her. Yeah. yeah I, th- I think Helen's like, I'll show you quickly his room because you can like capture something. Yeah. I don't know what though. Um, he's got some things that are, well, obviously it's his range room now, but it's very much been into it. Oh, let's go here instead. What, did you do this room? Yeah. Did you? This is much better, so I thought it was, yeah, I'm so glad you brought me through here. Okay. This is so much better. And it's got like these little things, he's got yeah. like, all these footprints and it's got his like uh, name on there and the door and things. So even though it's very true, no, it's still very much the same as well. Yes, so, yeah, yeah, this is what yeah. I just said. Yeah, that's what well. the new thing and then... Yes. Oh, do you want to do it here? Yes, I think so, yeah. <laughs> I'll put this slide on. My name's Nadia. My son Zane had Nema Pick Type C. He passed away in 2017. He was diagnosed when he was three months old. He was very yellow. Um, he had severe jaundice. And when we had blood tests done, they assumed it was a liver condition. Um, he went for loads of tests in hospital, MRIs, every single test going. Um, and the day we were supposed to leave, um, genetics came and asked us if we want to be involved in a study. We accepted, signed the consent forms, and eight weeks later, he was diagnosed with pneumopic disease. Obviously, as as parents, we went on to Google, which we shouldn't do, and um, our world came crashing down because it obviously gave us the worst scenario. He wouldn't live beyond five years old. Um, and um, yeah, we researched and we found pneumopic UK. It was it was a sh- it was a major shock for us because obviously um, nothing was picked up on pregnancy, nothing was picked up even after the birth. It was only when he was a month old. Um, and then looking back now, his stomach was a little on the larger side. He had an enlarged spleen and liver, which obviously we had no idea until he went for testing. Um, he wasn't gaining weight as a normal child would, but then again, we just thought you know it's one of those newborn things and they'll gain gain weight later on. So those were the shocking things. Um, but yeah, obviously when you get diagnosed, you never think in a million years your child's going to be diagnosed with a rare disease and then be told it's life limiting. Um, so yeah, a huge shock for us. We, it took a long time for us to actually um, register and you know um, uh, and come to terms with it. It took us a long time. And telling the other children as well and family members and we kept it quiet for quite a long time just because I think we were in denial in some ways. And because he was a baby at the time, some things you couldn't tell because obviously he wasn't going to talk anyway at that age and he wasn't going to walk. Um, and then it came apparent to people when he was one and he wasn't doing a lot of the stuff normal children his age would. In our mind, you know, we were like, oh, they're never going to go to school, they're never going to get married, you're not going to see anything. So yeah, your world does come crush- crushing down. Once we got the diagnosis in the hospital, the doctors left and never came back. So we were sitting there wondering, what now? What do we do next? So we're so glad we came across Nema Pick UK because I think we'd be lost without them, mm. in all fairness. No one knew. It's such a rare condition. There's not a lot out there information-wise until you actually come across this charity. So yeah, we're so glad we found them. Yeah, it must be quite a comfort to have. Yeah, definitely. Because, because all the consultants and doctors never even knew about the 
condition. They've never heard of it. They didn't know what to do. They were Googling themselves, which was funny. But as soon as you come across other parents and um, who have also gone through it and yeah. obviously the charity and like Tony who's obviously involved with your journey because obviously if the doctors don't know then you, you've got no hope whereas a lot of the parents obviously gone through it they could give advice and that was so um, helpful at the times when you know it was early days then we didn't know what was going to happen we had we had no prognosis at the time um, and yeah, every every day was like, God, what's going to happen now? What's going to happen now? And I think because he was quite poorly at the time as well, we just didn't know if he was going to make it to one, mm -hmm. if he was going to make it to two. We just we just had no idea at the time. But then when you go to conference and you see other children who are older and who are doing well, and you know, yeah, it just gives you hope. It it just gave us so much hope that you know he might get there and he might do all right. passed away in 2017 he was four and a half years old and um, it was in February actually he he just started to get worse with chest infections and um, breathing issues and respiratory issues and he um, was intubated in in Oxford in hospital um, and they did tell us that he, he won't have long left and once they extubate him he probably will pass away um, so we obviously got all our family around to say goodbye and obviously you can never prepare yourself for that even you know that they're going, you, you can't you can't prepare yourself. Um, so when they did extubate him, he was still slightly breathing, but they said that you know he won't make it to the morning. Um, so obviously we were really upset, and I held him for I think it was like five six hours at the time. I I didn't even want to eat anything. I didn't want to drink anything. I held him while he went, um, and all, all of a sudden it's really strange. His heart was still going, and I just thought they just said that his he flatlined and he was dead, but I could feel his heart and I could feel he was still a bit warm and he wasn't cold and, you know, um, so the doctors came and said, no, he, he will pass away. He, he won't live for 20, for another 24 hours. So they transferred us to Helen House, which is the hospice we use. Um, and he was very poorly at the time. He's very pale, very gray. So we sat with him all night. Um, and in the morning again, he was still there. Um, and he was there for another five weeks, which we were really shocked. And every day was more of a shock because he hadn't passed away, he hadn't gone. Um, so we were really upset at the time because we were so confused. We were just like, you know, is he going? Is he not going? Um, so they decided to start feeding him again and start giving him medication again and putting oxygen on him. And he kind of had a bit of colour in his face and improved slightly um, to the point they got us home because my wishes weren't for him to be at home if he's gonna pass away. We didn't want him in a hospice or hospital. We wanted him at home, surrounded in his room, surrounded by his things. Um, and um, yeah, his, um, his siblings all went away with their dad um, on holiday. And three weeks after they went, he passed away peacefully at home, um, no pain. Um, yeah, he, he, it was just me and him. Um, and he passed away peacefully, yeah. never ends grief goes on for a lifetime and um, you do get days where you're fine and everything's fine and then all of a sudden 
you know, there's a switch that goes off and then your world comes crashing down again and you get upset and then you have people around you um, and then you carry on again. And it's like that forever, I assume. I don't think it ever gets any better. I think it's just, um, yeah, it's always there in your mind, no matter what you do, where you go, whether you have more children, um, grief will always be there. How do you and your family honour theirs in? So, um, so we go to his grave a lot because it's very local to us. Um, and every year on his um, anniversary of his death or his birthday, we we actually, um, it, it's very different to what normal people do. We actually send money to Africa to feed the poor children mm. in his memory. Um, and pre-COVID, we actually raised money just as a family and built a well in the poorest um, town in Africa. Um, where they had no water, they were walking for miles to get water, and we built it in the middle of nowhere, and all these children um, could go get water, families could get water, and now, um, two years on, they built a school there, and a shop there, and a um, praying mosque there, um, so that basically water is running in his memory, mm -hmm. and it will never run out, it's, it's there, so we do things like that, um, rather than do things like let balloons go, which are not safe for the environment. We do things like that and honour it in that way and, yeah, feed the poor. That's what we do in his memory. What, what um, that's me as a mother, but what, um, <laughs> that's probably a good idea rather <laughs> than doing these balloon releases. What, um, what are some, uh, maybe a couple of the memories that you have that you just hold on to that make you happy on, on those days? Right? Um, so obviously before he deteriorated, he was he, he, he had a brilliant smile and he did things like that. And the kids always remember things. They always talk about things like when he was eating and he, um, you know, we always used to say, oh, well done, Zane, you know. And then we realised in his top, all his food was in his top. And it was just like, we were thinking he's eating it, but it was all going down his top. And just little funny memories like that and holiday memories. In, um, we went to Tunisia and we've got those holiday memories of him in the pool laughing and smiling. And yeah, those memories we'll never forget. We, we remem remember those more than actually in his poorly days where he deteriorated. We just remember the happy memories. So obviously, yeah, I don't have a child we need to pick anymore. So I did feel a bit lost in some ways. Um, but yeah, I'd like to support other parents, especially if they're newly diagnosed, um, to say, you know, you're not alone in this journey. Um, support the parents who have got children we need to pick um, with advice or, you know, just being there for them. Um, and just, yeah, just being involved as much as I can with things like this as well. Um, because I think once you're involved, I don't think it's something you can ever leave. I think now Nima picks family regardless of anything. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's with me forever. And if a cure is found, even better. You know, I'd always like to listen to research, what comes in, what trials are, you know, what, what's new. Um, so, yeah. And, and you, you create a bond with so many parents for life. So it's one of those things that I don't think it'll ever, it'll ever leave. I'll be there to the end. <laughs>Not all that you can see is everything that's there, which is why so many affected by Neiman Pick diseases are often unseen or misunderstood. Neiman Pick UK is a small charity dedicated to making a difference to those affected by Neiman Pick diseases. To learn more and get involved, please visit npuk.org. Thank you.